So I want to start out. We'll do. Uh, we'll talk about Unka's Big Mocha, which is a film that will is kind of in the middle of things here because it takes us back to some of the things that we talked about before and takes us forward into some other things. Well, so we'll be using it as we go along. If you haven't gotten a chance to see it, uh, it is a little bit, it's a little bit old. It's from, I don't know, the early 70s, I would say, or uh, no, probably around the yeah mid 70s because it's the independence, it's the, the independence of Papua New Guinea. If you, uh, the very first scenes are the, the headman of the rival tribe has flying back and forth or flying back to his home in the highlands because he's a member of parliament to discuss the independence of Papua New Guinea. So you have this juxtaposition of these, what we might consider to be two different worlds that you have these so-called tribes in the highlands but they're very integrated into the nation state or the emerging nation state that is emerging out of a colonial relationship uh, with Australia and with, the, and with the sort of British system. And so you have this kind of, uh, of a number of you got a little bit tricked out by that question because there is that sort of national politics going on there between some the the leader of the tribe that Anka's giving his big gift to and the the national assembly and the the writing of the of the constitution for the independence of Papua New Guinea so we have here though this system in which people and we so this is a, a different kind of of economic system than what we were talking about with Richard Lee and the Kalahari so we have here people who are raising uh, some some small scale crops, some horticulture, as well as of course pigs, and pigs are hugely important. So they're doing kind of small scale. It's not it's not large scale agriculture. It's sort of small scale, uh, you know. They but they are quite different in the sense that they are organized uh, in some ways more hierarchically. And so the the mocha is actually the. Uh, it's seen as a, a gift that you give. Technically, it's, it's seen as an investment and mocha is, is the interest on that investment. And so once these, this mocha exchange starts, then you have to give a larger gift at a, at, a, at a time later. And that sort of grows the gift system as you go along. So in part, it's kind of a, like, a balanced reciprocity in, in terms of it's a system of gift giving, but it also has elements, you might say, of, redis or of redistribution, where resources are flowing up to the big man of the tribe, but they're also flowing back down in the form of uh, these, this large gift exchange that's going on. I like this film a lot for uh, various reasons. Sometimes I use it here to talk about economics, it also gives you a sense of what anthropological fieldwork might be like, which actually involves a lot of waiting around, trying to figure out what people are saying. Um, you may notice that Anka is talking very rapidly and the subtitles are very limited. And so, you know, he's either, he, he's probably listing, when he says, you know, pigs are everything, you know, he's been listing all the things that you can use pigs for. And I can imagine either, you know, the poor anthropologist trying to scribble it all down or you couldn't actually even subtitle it. Anka is a, is a great speaker here. So it gives us a sense of a, a slightly different economic system than we were talking about with the gathering and hunting peoples that, Rich, that uh, Richard Lee was documenting and a different uh, system of, of procuring food and exchange than, than we had been reading about in terms of generalized reciprocity. I also asked here, what kind of, what, what authority does Anka have? How does he get people to do things? Brooke, what does he do? How can he get people to do things? He doesn't have control over them. And so this is a very important point. The only thing, he is the, he is the respected leader or the big man, but 
he doesn't have what we're we'll talk about this he doesn't have coercive power and so in there are some societies uh, that anthropologists have studied in which no one has coercive power over other people that is you can't make anyone do anything and so Anka is unable to make people do things he can try in his best way to be very persuasive and even in places where people have coercive power you have to try to persuade people and make them want to do things it's not the persuasion goes away but in some cases there are societies where they're they don't really have the same kind of, of ability to make people do things from one to the other. So he has a, a, a different kind of, or, or their, their society is structured around a different kind of authority. And so the way that he, the way that he can acquire reputation and prestige, as, as you knew, is by, is by giving things away until it finally gets to that wonderful last line, Emma, where he says, he talked about how he like won because he gave, like he gave so much. Like I think it was like six hundred pigs and like some cows and like some other things. But he felt like he won because he gave um so much. Six hundred pigs at I don't know if you caught how much they're worth. They're worth about two hundred and fifty dollars each in Australian dollars, which is. A lot of money if you do that on your calculator you'll see ten thousand dollars eight cows one truck one motorbike and 12 of those cassowaries and he says yes i have won i have knocked you down by giving so much of course we never get to see that that's another of the ironies of of anthropological field work where it's all the build-up of you know i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it and then you never actually get to to see the thing the film crew had to had to go away. But yes, at the very end, he is able to say that he has he has won, he has, he has knocked it down. In the next couple of classes, we'll look at it in further at some of the things uh, that we see in terms of gender here. So I just want to flag that for you. Uh, you may notice there's some wonderful scenes in the film where it cuts between uh, Anka doing his kind of Anka thing and doing the mochas and then have the uh, rumuka carrying the sweet potatoes and the kind of the women's labor that makes that happen. You may remember back to the economics chapter in terms of they're talking about the banana leaves and the exchanges of women that in some ways feed into the prestige of men. So there's a gendered thing going on. We'll talk about that uh, in, the, in the next class for Tuesday is about gender and, and uh, sexuality. And, uh, and then there's the kinship aspect here. Uh, you may notice that, that Anka is a, it has, I think he starts off with three or four wives and then acquires another one, not because, you know, not because he's getting much out of it except for labor. And so there's a sort of uh, kinship and marriage aspect, which we'll be talking about, which is the aspect of, of being uh, who can be in a, a polygamous relationship as opposed to a monogamous one. Um, so we'll be talking about that in the class a week from now on Thursday and then into Tuesday. And then I just, I wanted to also note here, I mean, we talked about the, the politics and flying in airplanes and, and the nation state that's emerging here. But what else did you see? There was evidence that Anka is participating in a, in a bigger world than might have been previously. What's he wearing? He's like barely wearing any clothes the whole film and then whenever he does the he gets all dressed up for that, but he does have some very favorite clothes that he's wearing. Does anybody remember that t-shirt? Oh, the famous do it in the road t-shirt, which I don't know, you probably don't remember this reference. 
Never heard of it. The Beatles had a very famous song. Well, maybe it wasn't their most famous song, but you know, it was popular at, at, at the time. Why don't we do it in the road? And so he's got this t-shirt that I think also may have been linked to a political party. He's got his hat, he's got his uh, he's got dentures, he's got his uh, his suit coat. Uh, so he is actually very linked into uh, this, this wider world. You can see a lot of the colonial influence. And then also, uh, how did he get this money? The coffee. the coffee, yes. He was, they grow coffee and they feed that into the world economy. So it said, uh, you know, it, they're selling coffee. He has a bank account. He knows about interest from the bank as well. And so this is, you know, something that he's he's sort of organizing there. And then at the end, I like to ask, so there, there were six films made in this series um, and, and we've seen one of them in its entirety. We'll probably watch another one in half of it. It was a film series called Disappearing World. And the idea is, oh, we better jump in there like anthropologists often thought, we better jump in there with a camera and record this stuff because it's all going to be going away. It's all going to be disappearing if we don't get in there. What do you think about that, John? Is this world about to vanish? Why not? I mean, um, I feel like that type of society could still persist and exist, like the way they still go. Like, if you, I can compare it to like hunter and gather societies where people think like that doesn't exist, but there's still some that do exist today. And from that, like, the lifestyle still exists. Yeah, I mean, I think that what was interesting, what's interesting about this is, you know, we talk about 600 pigs and the amount of money and, you know, I mean, that's probably more than my house is worth. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing investment. And at the end, actually, it says, well, the, these things have been getting too big. They're actually in, increasing in size to the extent that the, the neighboring Hedman says he doesn't want to do them anymore because he feels like they've become too large. And it's actually one of the paradoxes of how people enter into uh, often the colonial, colonial and capitalist system is that sometimes that means that they rev up certain ceremonies or certain traditions and they get kind of revved up by the new cash economy. So something we want to keep our eye on as we, as we read along uh, you know, it, it's not to say that people don't get steamrolled sometimes by the in the incursion of of ca the cash economy and and their insertion into the capitalist economy, but in some ways that can ramp up certain traditional features of of their society. Again, I'm not trying to say that they did well. There's a follow up film to this which talks about uh, in some ways their their struggles to. Uh, it's hard to produce coffee. Let's just put it that way. This is not uh, this is not an easy thing to do. And so they talk about some of their struggles to kind of preserve and keep their their lives together. But at least at the moment of this film, there's probably the evidence for disappearance is certainly uh, not there. So, uh, like I said, I think this is a good film to think about some of the things we've already talked about, as well as to kind of think about some things we're about to talk about. All right, so this chapter and the Onka film are, this chapter is titled, How Do Anthropologists Study Political Relations? Which is a, a question again that you have never had in your life. Um, you didn't want to know that. Um, you probably are kind of perhaps confused that we are going to be talking about politics and countries and nations in an anthropology class. It seems like something we shouldn't be doing, that anthropologists are supposed to be studying people out there who don't have anything to do with politics. I want to reframe the question a little bit as to not how, but why would we study politics at all? And the thing about politics, if you look at the very first pages of this chapter, is it is about the ways that humans organize themselves and the distribution of power in a society. And we've, we've been hinting 
that whenever we look at culture, we want to know about power as well and who's kind of controlling the situation and what is going on there. But the question of politics goes back into a larger philosophical issue that emerges, especially in the European context. Uh, Levin and Schultz on page 372 call it a concern with that or the, the assumptions of early, earlier Western thinkers. And our, our Western thinker that they give us is Thomas Hobbes. And Hobbes was writing a long time ago, but his writings in some ways would define the way that people thought about uh, life and how it was organized and how we should, how we should live. Um, Hobbes in Levin and Schultz, they call it the war of all against all. It's variously translated. I think he originally wrote in Latin, the bellum omnium contra omnes, or is it sort of translated into, into old English, the war of everyone against everyone. And basically Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes was postulating that in a state, what he, he would imagine to be a state of nature, that everybody is fighting each other. It's every person, he would probably say, every man for himself, it's the war of all against all. And so for Hobbes, he believed that what needed to happen is that there needed to be a strong state, a strong government that would pacify or civilize the people so that they would not always be fighting each other. And so this is actually, although it seems to us sort of from a faraway time, it is actually a debate which defines how people understand themselves in relationship to the state and in relationship to the government. And so, you know, I think that for, if we think about to one of today's pressing issues, the role of the police in society, there are people who say, well, we need the police because if we don't have the police, there's no order. Everybody's fighting each other. And they may not know it, but this is kind of a deeply Hobbesian concern where the other people will say, no, we can, we can organize ourselves. We don't need to have a policing coercive mechanism here. And so there's a kind of counterpoint to Hobbes, which has always been running along, which is the idea that people are self-organizing. So again, Hobbes here is, um, is kind of a is kind of a first assumption about people who were said to be to lack a state government. So anthropologists go off and they try to find, you know, their their first assumptions following Hobbes is that the only way to have a government and courts and law and police and all those things is if people like this are in control of society. And so that's kind of the, the reigning assumption when anthropologists start doing their work. And the assumption is that if you have somebody that looks more like this, then they must lack government, lack self-control, lack be primitive, not have any kind of political system. And so uh, this is sometimes described in the literature as a stateless society, that means like there's an absence of a state or the absence of a government. And again, it, it filters into some of our ideas uh, that we talk about. Sometimes uh, we haven't heard about this for a while, but you know, sometimes we talk about American uh, or intervention in other countries. And we'll be like, well, we're, we're there to spread democracy. We're going to bring democracy to people. Even if we have to kill a few to do it, at least we're going to bring them democracy. Um, and so, you know, the idea is that people can't organize themselves unless it's sort of done from above upon them. So, in the question of anthropology then was how do people organize? Yeah, one of my animations popped up too fast. So, one of the things that anthropologists first discovered 
is that even in these so-called stateless societies, people were able to organize themselves in amazing ways. For one thing, they couldn't figure out, what, a lot of people couldn't figure out what, how and why people who didn't seem to have a government or an army were able to organize resistance to the colonial order. And so actually this was something that uh, Evans Pritchard, uh, we, see, we saw him in that film, Strange Beliefs. He shows up here again uh, among the Azandi to talk about how people organize themselves. It was not a war of all against all. Uh, they were able to organize themselves even though they were lived in a stateless society. He would also write about another, uh, another African people called the New Air, and they were directly involved with basically fighting against British rule. And so one of the things that he was in some ways trying to figure out is how is it that people organize themselves even in the absence of a state government? And we can talk about economic and political organizations such as the the Uncas, the big mochas that, that Unka is able to organize. One of the ideas that Evans Pritchard and other anthropologists promoted is that without a state government, people are often able to use kinship ties and call upon the idea of kinship ties in order to organize society. We'll talk about this more in the next uh, couple weeks. I do want to say, and this was my animation happening too fast, beware of the idea that was often had that in old societies or other societies, they're mixing up their kinship and their, and their politics. But in our society, we are simply, you know, we, we're a meritocracy. We only give political leadership to the smartest and best. I guess we don't have to beware that idea anymore because we've seen so many examples of us not giving political leadership to the smartest and best. We're not really uh, believing in meritocracy as much. But that was one of the, the assumptions that was made. And so anthropologists would say, one, there is the idea that you can organize yourself by kinship and other ideas, even in the absence of a state government. And there are other things that you might not see from the outside if you aren't looking for them, but they work well. So one of the examples uh, which Lavin and Schultz talk about toward the end of this chapter is uh, what uh, one of my colleagues has called uh, vernacular statecraft, which is uh, you know the, the idea that there are these everyday activities that people do like making lists and enumerating people, which they sometimes actually use to resist the state government and political control, um, they kind of turn that, those, those ideas on their head. But again, this is an example of things that if you're just looking from the outside and it doesn't look like people are organizing themselves, but you see from, from the inside and you can see uh, ways in which people uh, organize themselves. So anthropology, like what we talked about in economics, tries to bring politics into a holistic relationship with other areas of life. So we see it as related to things like religion, related to things like economics, related to things like kinship and gender. And so you're going to get more of that holism uh, from, a, from an anthropological understanding of politics. And so, like I said, we have challenged the idea that in other societies, there's a lack or an absence of political organization. We have also challenged the idea that, that when we get to be so-called modern or contemporary societies, that all of a sudden kinship and gender go away as relevant forces. I think, like I said, we've seen in the last 10 years or so that gender and kinship are very much uh, at work in our modern political system. So we have plenty of examples of, of that uh, floating around us now. We don't have to worry. And then I think that anthropology importantly gives us tools for analyzing the political situation, things that we might not have thought about. And what I want to do is describe, I'm going to try and describe five tools or five ideas 
that I think anthropology has given, and I'd just like you to think about them in terms of, of how it might intersect with your own life. So here it goes. First idea or tool that I would ask you to think about, or it might be good to think about, is the difference between persuasive power and coercive power. We've talked about this with, uh, with Onka a little bit. In some societies, there is not someone with coercive power. You, the only power that it has had is persuasive power. But in most societies, some people at least have access to coercive power. I think one of the best examples of this that we can talk about today that we've all perhaps experienced in different ways is the masking thing, right? There are a lot of places where people try to persuade other people to wear masks, but they didn't invoke a, what we would call a mask mandate or a law that would coerce people into wearing masks. And then there are other places where people tried to persuade people, but they also used coercive power to do it. I believe here in Hartwick, we are an instance of a coercive power to wear masks, right? If I just throw this mask down, what can you do? <laughs> if I say, screw it, I'm not doing this. What's your next move? Um, maybe. <laughs> I guess if like you felt comfortable, you could email someone. But like I don't know. <laughs> you could you could, you could put it back on. I guess I don't you know. could. Tr well, yeah. I mean, I guess I'm using myself as an example, and now you're getting a little nervous because you're like, well, I don't know if I have coercive power over my professor. That's my professor, right? Maybe I should use you. What if you throw your mask down and say, I'm not doing this? What can I do? I can try to persuade you, but I can also, what can I do? You could do it to me too. You just might not want to. Huh? Force me. Well, you could, you could try to use coercive power and you probably could win too, but you don't want to do that because then I might, you know, I might scoff on you or something. How do you force me? What can you do? You must have access to this. You can call, call Campo on me, right? Can't you? You can send somebody down to enforce the law, right? And so, there are societies, and we're one of them, where you try to persuade people to do the thing that you want them to do, but in the last instance, somebody's gonna come down and walk me out of here, right? I mean, you know, there are, in, in terms of professors, you could lose your job. Uh, in terms of students, you can get kicked out, right? It's a coercive thing. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to say it's good or bad. I'm just saying there is coercive and, and it doesn't have to be physical force, but you know, you, you, you aren't able to do what you might want to do because someone else is coercing you. So yeah, <laughs> uh, it is true, Emma. You probably would be like, you probably want to walk out if your professor did that before you did the whole like, you know, calling campus security. That, that does sound dangerous, but anyway. All right, tool number two. The idea of domination and the idea of hegemony. For many people out there in the world, uh, these would be synonymous. Well, for many of people out there in the world, hegemony doesn't mean anything because we've never heard that word before. We know what domination is, right? One person ruling over another. If you look up in the dictionary, hegemony usually means the same thing somebody ruling over or controlling another person. In anthropology though, following 
some of the ideas of Antonio Gramsci, who was an Italian political philosopher. He started to make a distinction between what he called domination, which is basically coercive force that is used to make you do something you don't want to do or don't believe in, right? So this happens to people, right? They don't want to do it, but because it is a law or because society is making them do it, they are in a dominated position and they don't have a choice. And he distinguished that from what he called hegemony, which is how people believe in a system and basically buy into it and do and live out the system, even if it isn't necessarily benefiting them. And so this is a, an interesting thing to think about. For example, people have always been puzzled about in the United States, why people who are poor or working class still seem to just buy into the system and believe in the American dream. Because it rarely works, but still people are like way into it. They love it. And so that is the idea of hegemony, which is that people are believing in the system, even though they might be at the bottom of it. And so, you know, there's always that idea, well, I might get rich. If I win the lottery. I don't want to have a high tax rate. So don't tax those rich people because, you know, never know, I might be rich. Um, so the idea of hegemony is a, is a subtly distinction be between that and just sort of straight up domination. If you are able, if you are a person in charge of things and you have hegemony, then you have, you have something good. I'm trying to think. So, yeah, no, it's like, I guess it's the difference between It's like by it's like believing in the system that that uh, believing in the grading system <laughs> that somehow there's something like that 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 there is that there is something about that that is measuring uh, people's worth and you know that's what, if people believe that then there's a kind of a feeling of hegemony and then people do what you want you don't have to dominate them they just they just do what it is that that is society wants them to do. So it's another, uh, hopefully another interesting tool that you can use. These things kind of get combined or there's a, there's a way in which we can see it as related to a third tool that I wanna talk about, which is the idea of the state or the government and what kind of force is legitimate. So this is, this is actually a, an idea that can, comes to us from the sociologist Max Weber back a little bit over a hundred years ago. And what he said was, you know, because a lot of people are like, well, what is the state or what is the government? And he said, the state is a human community that claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. So, Maybe I'll go back to my masking example, right? Let us say that I've thrown my mask on the ground. Is it okay for you? You know that's wrong. Can you come over and punch me? No, you're not supposed to, right? And if we get in a fight, let's say we get in a, let's say you come over and punch me and you do it, Am I supposed to punch you back? I guess I can until the police get here, right? This is why we believe. So we believe that there is another entity out there, the state, the police, maybe not campus police. I'm not sure if they're, they have full legitimacy here, but they're the ones that can use physical force and that is considered legitimate. Although as soon as I'm saying that, I'm realizing that this is part of the debate in our society, right? How much legitimate physical force are we going to give to certain people? Some people are like, totally, give them all the force they need, right? Other people are like, no, we wanna cut that force back. 
Weber's, you know, I mean, it's a really interesting idea. I would say that Weber was writing from Germany at a time when not everybody had guns. And so this is kind of an idea that works in many different societies. In our society, the fact that everybody has a gun, it seems like, means that if you don't show up with a gun, then somebody's going to use a gun on you, right? So, you know, we have this thing. In most other countries, the police are not armed. They don't have to be armed because nobody else is armed. Uh, so this is, you know, I mean, I, I say that, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a super interesting idea about does the state have legitimate physical force? In the United States, this has always been a contentious issue because there are a lot of private citizens who believe that they should have legitimate physical force. Let's get out of the United States for a second. Let's talk about Anka. This is actually a good example from Anka. If you remember, there's a rivalry between these two, these two tribes and they're gonna go down and like beat somebody up. And Anka is standing there in the road and he says, no, that's what we did in the old days. In the new, in these days, the police and the state got rid of all that, so we don't fight each other anymore. So you know that that's what he's he's trying to say. It doesn't he doesn't have coercive power himself, so it doesn't exactly work, or it, it works on some people. But again, the idea is in I'll, I'll, I'll opposite it in some societies. If you punch me, then I can like punch you back and really hurt you. And that's legitimate. And that might start a feud in which our two families are fighting for like generations and we raid each other. And, you know, I don't know if we like it, but that's not, nobody's stopping it. Nobody's, nobody thinks that that's an illegitimate use of force. So Weber's idea was that when you have a state government, it's one entity that in a given territory, has the, the claim that whatever it does is legitimate and nobody else should be able to use force. And if you do, then you might get thrown in jail, right? Then you're not, you're not using legitimate physical force. All right. Tool number four, the idea of the nation state. So Weber here was talking about just the idea of a state or a government. In the last 200 years, this other idea has emerged that people need to belong to a nation, which is also part of a government. And so this is the idea of uh, a nation state. Now we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about language and languages. And I made the comment that in many places around the world, it was considered more common to speak multiple languages, not just one. But in recent years, and by recent, I mean the last 200 years or so, there's this idea that emerged that all people should have one language. I mean, all people in a given territory should have one land, one language, one people. And one of the people that they mention, uh, Lavin and Schultz mentions uh, the famous writings of Benedict Anderson, who called this the establishment of an imagined community. So if you think about your, your, an actual community, right, your, maybe your town or your village or, or maybe your dorm, it's where people see each other and interact with each other all the time. And so that is what we would consider a real community. What Anderson was basically saying is, is that the nation state creates the idea that you are in community with a whole bunch of people that you will never ever meet in your life. And you might do a bunch of things for them, even though you'll never see them. You might go to war for them, even though you have nothing to do with them. So the idea is that we are all part of this bigger thing called a nation. So somebody in California, you know, we have very little in common, but somehow we consider ourselves to be Americans or 
United Statesians or, you know, so the idea is that there's a homogeneous, somewhat homogeneous population and that we all share this thing together. This is actually, again, it's an unusual idea. And to sort of illustrate its unusualness, I want to take a quote from a politician who was trying, who was one of the people who basically united what is considered to be the modern Italian country. And what he said in 1861 is after years of kind of trying to bring these various principalities and kingdoms together, he was able to, with other people, create this centralized government. And so he said, we have made Italy. Now we must make Italians. And what he meant by that is kind of a strange thing to say, especially if, you know, this is not, this is pretty late in history in 1861, is that people didn't think of themselves as Italians. They thought of themselves as maybe being from a, a, a village or a community. Um, a lot of people had different allegiances, part of a family. And so what he was saying was, is we need to create this sense of that, they, that people live in a country. We got the country, we have the state apparatus, now we have to make Italians. And so how do you do that? A lot of it has to do with establishing a national school system. You make everybody learn the same language. So uh, my own grandfather, he did not speak what is called Italian, even though he lived in that in what is was technically considered Italy. Uh, they spoke something that he called dialect. It was not actually something that you could understand in related, I mean, you could kind of, there were some parallels to Italian. And when he went to school, that's where they start, you know, slapping you around and making you speak the national language, which was a subset or a, a, a language that was spoken uh, around the, uh, the central or the Tuscany region. Same thing in France. At the time of the French Revolution, the majority of the people who live in what is now considered France did not speak standard French. They spoke a bunch of other things. And so part of it is standardizing the language, standardizing the history books, making people read things, literacy, to create this sense that you are on the same page or plane as other people. Being in the military, compulsory military service can be a good way to mix people up together from different parts of the country. Um, so, you know, there were, uh, for example, in, in, in Italy, there was a huge divide between the northerners and the southerners. But if you mix them up in the military and send the southerners north and the northerners south, um, it tends to create this idea of national unity. So there's a fourth tool. It's to, to sort of think about how it is that people became had developed this allegiance to this abstract idea of a nation. It is not something that uh, it is it is not something that is eternal in human history. It emerges about 200, 250 years ago. Fifth tool, final tool. The section of the the end of the chapter, what Levin and Schultz called global politics in the 21st century. It's a very, it's a short, but it's actually only one, say short. It's a short section. It's a long paragraph. It's a, the paragraph itself is too long. But if you read through each of those sentences and kind of think about how they have affected our own life and our own elections in this country, it will help to explain a lot of what is happening. And so I guess I would just urge you to kind of read through that because it's talking about how you have this, uh, you had a, a system of colonial rule, like we saw in, in sort of other European and North American countries or North Atlantic countries ruling over others. Then you had this time of independence and the idea that each place should have its own nation state. But 
at the same time, that's a very difficult prospect. And you have these economic and political flows developing, which bring some of the formerly colonized peoples into the, the, the places of the colonizers. And so people get very upset about these flows and the, the ideas of, of immigration. Uh, and so, you know, we can see this in, in our own country. We can see it in, in, the, in the, the, the Brexit movement in, in, in Britain. Uh, you know, the idea that the world is changing too fast and that what are these, what are these people doing here? And the point of this, or I mean, the, the, one of the things that's worth reading about this is, is whenever you think about, you see somebody and you say, what are you doing here? It's often because of a historical relationship between the people who were the colonizers and the people who were the colonized. And so what people are doing in those places is trying to work, earn a living. Uh, there may be uh, political troubles that have happened in their own home societies. And so we have this situation in which people still have this idea that everyone needs to belong to a nation state and everyone in that nation state should be the same. At the same time that people are having to move around, whether they want to or not, people are being brought into different places and then people get very excited about that, politically excited about that. And so, um, I guess I'll read, I'll read one, one, a couple sentences. While some have been able to benefit enormously from the growth of global capitalism, many others have been left out. And so there's the idea that, you know, as, as the world has changed, lots of people have made money, but others don't feel like they have. As inequalities widen, local leaders and their followers struggle to manage the consequences with or in spite of the intervention of outside powers. So people in various places, our own country and others are trying to figure out, you know, how do you fit into this system in a, at a time when the inequalities are widening. One major consequence has been the increased flows of migrants and refugees seeking to escape the violence. Again, this is something that we see uh, if you, know our, our own national politics and, and the kinds of uh, ideas about refugees and migrants on the southern border, you know, a lot of those people have been displaced precisely because of a political relationship uh, which the United States uh, had with Central American countries. And so, you know, like I said, this, there's, there's this push and pull between the idea that, you know, uh, the, these old ideas that everyone in a country has to be homogeneous and the, uh, and the actually existing diversity of people on the ground. And so I guess I would say that, uh, well, let's read the last sentence, which is many long taken for granted notions about identity and belonging now seem up for grabs everywhere on earth, which is to say that people are wondering who they are and what, what their place is in the world. And that leads to some, some painful reflections. And I hope that, you know, one of the, the main points of this class, going back to uh, the idea of evolution and diversity and variation and human variability is that we do not necessarily have to be automatically afraid of global flows, diversity, and these kinds of different ideas. These ideas have been with us for a very long time. And, uh, and there's, there's no reason to, to, uh, to, to get that excited about uh, coercing people out of their identities. So that is our fifth tool, five of five, going into uh, next week, we'll start talking about, I think they're using that as a segue into the idea of gender and sexuality, which is something that people get very excited about, and then into the ideas of kinship, marriage, and family are these sort of bedrock ideas of, of human identity.